In 1945, the United States dropped two atomic bombs over Japan. Nicknamed Little Boy and Fat Man, the bombs killed over 200,000 people, decimated the country's infrastructure, and psychologically emasculated the nation into a state of despair. The United States had shattered the illusion of invincibility once held by Japan's ruling elite, who until then believed that through military conquest, Japan was destined to become the world's largest global power. This is a story about the economic miracle that rebuilt Japan, only for the notion of indefinite prosperity and global dominance to again disillusion Japan's rulers until they lost control of the economy and let Japan fall upwards into an era known as the Lost Decade. An era where there was no economic opportunity in Japan, and neither the politicians or economists could understand why. Unlike in Germany, where the Allies had abolished the German state after the war, the Americans chose to allow the Japanese state to continue to exist, but Douglas MacArthur, the general of the United States military, would be in charge. Japan's prior ruler was the emperor, a divine leader who the people of Japan widely considered to be a living god. After the war, there was tremendous pressure from both allied countries and Japanese leftists who demanded that the emperor step down and be indicted as a war criminal. But MacArthur felt that ruling Japan via the emperor would make his job much easier, and so the allied forces shielded him from war responsibilities. MacArthur and his staff were deeply involved in rebuilding Japan's industries, all while eradicating militarism and ultranationalism from the public sentiment, and instead promoting the idea of civil liberties and democratic institutions. <laughs> As a part of Harry Truman's Marshall Plan, the United States sent $2.4 billion to rebuild Japan's infrastructure, purchase raw materials, and stabilize Japan's currency. Japan offered subsidies and tax incentives to enterprise manufacturers to export more and more Japanese goods and enhance the competitiveness of Japanese products on the international stage. Japan would continue exporting larger and larger volumes of raw materials to the world, developing critical industries like steel, coal, cotton, and textiles. Japan's export targets became so ambitious that MacArthur's staff even curated campaigns to encourage integrating women into these labor-intensive industries. As the effective leader of Japan, MacArthur had final say on the details that would be included in Japan's new constitution, a constitution that would be written by Americans to look out for American interests. <laughs> In preparation for the political evolution to come, MacArthur publicly undermined the imperial mystique of the emperor. MacArthur had his staff release a picture of his first meeting with the emperor, and this picture shocked the Japanese public, who for the first time saw the emperor as a mere man, overshadowed by the much taller MacArthur instead of the living god he was always portrayed as. Until this point, the emperor had been a remote, mysterious figure to his people, rarely seen in public and typically photographed from a certain angle to make him look taller and more impressive than he really was. The Japanese government immediately banned the photo of the emperor, but MacArthur rescinded the ban and ordered all of the Japanese newspapers to print it. The photo was intended as a message to the emperor, as a reminder of who was the senior partner in their relationship. And then, in 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea. The United States rushed to South Korea's defense and proceeded to bomb over 85% of North Korea's buildings. This served as the first ever major bombing campaign since the inception of the US Air Force and the cost of shipping supplies to the Korean Peninsula all the way from America quickly became too costly. 
The Americans then turned to the Japanese economy for the procurement of necessary equipment. While this stimulated the Japanese economy tremendously, it caused Japan's public to become increasingly frustrated with America's occupation of Japan. It was time for MacArthur to propose his new constitution to Japan's political leaders. The constitution stated that Japan would not be authorized to develop its own military, but would instead enjoy protection directly from the United States. And in order to protect Japan, the US would operate military bases in Japan. At first, Japan's leaders said that they could not possibly accept the terms MacArthur had laid out. But MacArthur made it clear that they had no choice in the matter. And so Japan's leaders begrudgingly presented the constitution to their people as if it was their own. By the time the American occupation of Japan ended in 1952, the United States had successfully reintegrated Japan into the global economy, and the suspension that had been placed on Japan's pre-war politicians had come to an end. This marked the return of several Japanese nationalists, including Nobusuke Kishi. Kishi desperately wanted to be Japan's next prime minister, and his vision for Japan entailed revising the American-imposed constitution so that Japan could once again become a military power. Kishi wrote, in order for Japan to be truly respected in an increasingly globalized world, it must first revise its constitution and rearm. If Japan is alone in renouncing war, she will not be able to prevent others from invading her land. If, on the other hand, Japan could defend herself, there would be no further need for keeping United States garrison forces in Japan. Japan should be strong enough to defend herself. Kishi's message of a military reconstruction fared disastrously in the 1952 election, as Japan's general public, still scared from World War II, feared taking steps towards militarization. Ichiro Hotoyama, the founder of Japan's largest post-war political party, emerged as an overwhelming favorite to become Japan's next prime minister. Hotoyama was a true diplomat and even prior to World War II, he had consistently spoken against Japan's excessive militarization. But Hatoyama felt it was necessary for Japan and the USSR to get along with one another given their regional proximity. As the Cold War was escalating, the Americans found this unacceptable. And so the night before Hatoyama took office, the Americans warned Japan's politicians that if Hatoyama was elected prime minister, the Americans would reconsider their occupation of the country. Instead, the American-backed Shigeru Yoshida would be Japan's new prime minister. And with Yoshida's election, came the Yoshida Doctrine, a treaty that pledged economic and political loyalties to the Americans and promised never to align with the communist USSR. Kishi hated the Yoshida Doctrine, as it only exacerbated Japan's increasing dependency on the United States, who were an ocean away, all while aggravating the USSR, a military force in their backyard. But despite being selected prime minister to serve America's agenda, Yoshida still maintained his own vision for Japan's economic return. By eliminating the need to invest in militarization, Japan was able to focus all of its resources on rebuilding its domestic market and continuing Japan's development as a major global exporter. In order to prevent Japanese industries from being crushed by foreign competitors, Japan enacted tariffs and trade barriers on strategic industries like cars. By making foreign cars more expensive, Japanese automakers like Toyota and Nissan were able to develop footholds in the domestic market. This economic mindset was coined as incline production mode, and it sparked the beginning of Japan's economic miracle, as Japan's GDP would grow by an astounding 10% each year. Despite the economic success Japan was enduring, Yoshida would eventually lose control of his own party to a vengeful Hatoyama, who had been secretly planning his return ever since the Americans had disposed of him. As the new prime minister, Hatoyama strengthened Japan's relations with other Asian countries, as well as with the Soviet Union. But after only two years in office, Hatoyama resigned due to his old age and declining health. His successor held office for only 65 days before suffering the same fate. These unforeseen circumstances led Kishi to re-emerge as an unlikely prime minister. And so just as Japan's economy was finding its footing and Japan's interests became more aligned with the US, Japan's new leader would be a military-focused nationalist whose sole mission was to remilitarize Japan in order to turn it into the great global power 
it once was. By the time Kishi took office in 1957, Japan's economy had developed a strong foundation. The nation's exports now accounted for 10% of the country's GDP, which had been increasing by an average rate of 9.1% a year since 1950. In Kishi's first year as prime minister, and without the military he so badly wanted, Japan joined the United Nations Security Council. Japan also signed a new commercial treaty with Australia that would greatly bolster Japan's growing export industries, and in hopes of bettering Japan's perception amongst the Asian economies it had invaded during the war, Kishi paid war reparations to Indonesia. But to Kishi, none of this was the progress he was after. All Kishi cared about was developing enough political leverage to revise Japan's US security treaty. Suddenly, an opportunity presented itself. As access to markets in China and North Korea were cut off during the Cold War, Japanese and American leaders both felt it was necessary to maintain a strong influence over the markets in Southeast Asia. The Americans, concerned about the spread of communism in Asia, wanted to spur economic growth in the region to promote the ideals of capitalism. The only problem was, the Americans didn't want to spend any more of their own money to do it. Kishi viewed this as an opportunity and believed that if Japan invested some $500 million in Southeast Asia through low-interest loans and infrastructure projects, this would greatly improve Kishi's standing in Washington and give him more leverage in his talks to revise the US-Japan Security Treaty. So in 1957, Kishi presented the Asian Development Fund, which was to operate under the slogan, Economic Development for Asia, by Asia. Looking for members to join the ADF, Kishi presented the plan to the leaders of India, Pakistan, Burma, Thailand, and Taiwan. But with the exception of Taiwan, which agreed to join, the other nations neither committed to the idea, nor did they reject it. Frustrated by the lukewarm response, Kishi hit the international circuit again, this time visiting South Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Australia, and New Zealand. But Japan had either attacked or occupied all of these countries during World War II, and now none of them were interested in seeing Japan as an economic partner. Even in countries that were not occupied by Japan like India and Pakistan, Kishi encountered obstacles. Not only had Japan's war history prevented interests from other Asian countries, but the escalating Cold War between the United States and Soviet Union meant that aligning with Japan indirectly meant aligning with the United States, a move that countries in Asia were hesitant to do given their proximity to the USSR. Ultimately, a suspicion of Japanese motives, Cold War neutralism, and a fear that America may secretly be pulling the strings the entire time all contributed to the failure of Kishi's plan to create an Asian economic bloc, reminiscent of the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere that Japan had claimed to be pursuing in World War II. Not even the United States believed in Kishi's ADF. So eventually, Kishi gave up. Kishi was now no closer to revising the Japan-US Security Treaty, and so if economics wasn't going to win favor with the Americans, Kishi thought perhaps he could win favor the American way, by going on a massive, disingenuous press run. It was time for Kishi to charm America, which proved an ironic twist of fate considering that in 1941, Kishi, as a cabinet minister, signed Japan's declaration of war against the United States. Kishi had also governed over slave camps during World War II where thousands of Korean and Chinese slaves performed hard labor. Despite this, Vice President of the United States Richard Nixon introduced Kishi to speak in front of a joint session of Congress, referring to him as an honored guest who was not only a great leader of the free world, but also a loyal and great friend of the people of the United States. But Kishi's closest friend was actually a man named General Dojo, whom in 1948 the United States hung for war crimes. But if Nixon was willing to let the past be the past, so too would Kishi. Even after the war, Kishi always saw the system created by the Americans as temporary and intended that one day Japan would resume its role as a great power, but until then, 
he was prepared to subscribe to America's world order, both domestically and internationally, to safeguard Japan's interest. While in America, Kishi threw the opening pitch for the New York Yankees, played golf at the country's most prestigious all-white golf club in Virginia, and graced the front covers of Time Magazine and Newsweek, who mentioned nothing of Kishi's war crimes, but instead referred to him as a friendly, savvy salesman from Japan whose body packed pride, power, and passion. He was hailed as the perfect embodiment of the country's amazing economic resurgence. The American public believed that Kishi had turned Japan into Asia's economic powerhouse, but while Kishi was playing baseball in America, a revolution was brewing in Japan. The expansion of U.S. military bases continued to infuriate the Japanese public, and the likelihood of a mass protest began to scare Japan's politicians. Kishi took advantage of the rising tension and told President Eisenhower that if Japan was unable to militarize, it could not guarantee order in the country. Eisenhower finally agreed to negotiate the security treaty, but not because he trusted Kishi. The American ambassador to Japan at the time was Douglas MacArthur II, the nephew of General MacArthur, and his reports indicated that Kishi had now in fact become the most pro-American of the Japanese politicians, and if the U.S. refused to revise the security treaty in Japan's favor, Kishi would be replaced by a more anti-American leader. The United States, who up until that point had made a rather large bet on Japan, was now left with no other option than to bet on Kishi. And so now, more of an American ally than he had ever anticipated, Kishi got what he wanted. Eisenhower agreed to allow Japan to remilitarize, but the U.S. military bases based in Japan weren't going anywhere. This is when it became clear to Kishi's political opponents that rather than reduce the military influence America had in Japan, Kishi's motives for militarizing Japan evolved into a political tactic aimed at acquiring enough political leverage to break the long-standing tradition that prime ministers serve no more than two consecutive terms. Kishi was going to use Japan's new military to become the de facto ruler of Japan, reminiscent of Japan's pre-war emperor days. Now, President Eisenhower was the one who was going to visit Japan, and this visit was going to be the first time a sitting U.S. president had ever visited Japan, and Kishi found it imperative to have the new security treaty ratified prior to President Eisenhower's arrival. But his political opponents vowed to do everything in their power to block the revised treaty and bring an end to Kishi's administration. Even though the revised treaty addressed almost all of Japan's complaints with the original treaty and put the U.S.-Japan alliance on a much more equal footing, Kishi's political rivals stalled the ratification of the treaty. Japan's public also grew more and more frustrated as the treaty still allowed for the presence of U.S. military bases on Japanese soil and further committed Japan to use its military to defend the U.S. if necessary. With all of Japan turning against him, Kishi decided to force his agenda, and on May 19, 1960, Kishi called for a snap vote to ratify the treaty. When legislators attempted a sit-in to block the vote, Kishi called upon 500 policemen to physically drag his political opponents out of the legislative chambers, and Kishi then passed the revised treaty with only members of his own party present. These anti-democratic actions infuriated all of Japan, and the country demanded he resign. But considering he had just gotten what he wanted after so much waiting, such a proposition was unthinkable. But then something equally unthinkable happened in Korea that would change everything. Just a month later, a revolution in Korea broke out and displaced the U.S.-backed president, Syngman Rhee. This event inspired Japanese protesters, and it showed that autocratic governments could in fact be defeated by popular protests, even if they had backing by the United States. Frustrated Korean students played a crucial role in the success of Korea's revolution, which terrified Kishi. Desperate to stay in office long enough to host Eisenhower's visit, Kishi hoped to secure the streets in time for Eisenhower's arrival and considered calling upon Japan's self-defense forces as well as tens of thousands of right-wing thugs that would have been provided by his friend, the Yakuza-affiliated right-wing fixer, 
Yoshio Kodama. However, he was talked out of these extreme measures by his cabinet, only for a more extreme reality to take place. One afternoon, a group of anti-military protesters were attacked by right-wing ultranationalist counter-protesters who rammed them with trucks and attacked them with wooden bats spiked with nails. Not even a few minutes later, radical left-wing activists from the nation's student federation smashed their way into Japan's legislative chambers. This sparked a long battle with police, who beat the unarmed students with their batons in front of mass media reporters and televised cameras. Kishi now had no choice but to cancel Eisenhower's visit, take responsibility for the chaos, and announce his resignation. Although Kishi was now gone, the treaty between Japan and the U.S. had already been ratified. Refusing to honor it would have been disastrous for Japan's new brand. That is, until the new prime minister, Haito Akita, responded to the chaos with a new vision for Japan, a simple vision that promised more prosperity and less political turmoil. Aikida's plan, do everything necessary to double Japan's economy in just 10 years. In the next chapter of this story, we will witness Japan overcome this phase of political turmoil and put forward a new sense of Japanese nationalism, one based not on military might, but economic prosperity. Japan's economy was about to become the second largest economy in the world, and this economic prosperity would serve as a catalyst for the most dramatic asset bubble in history. At the peak of that bubble, greed, arrogance, and fear would blind Japan's ruling elite from the inevitable pitfalls Japan's economy was heading towards. This would lead Japan into the lost decade, and you should subscribe to the channel, because the second half of this story drops next week, and it's going to be quite epic.